Hello everyone and welcome to a presentation on how to present the output of your scientific research theories uh, as pattern handbooks. My name is Dr. Griele. This is my contribution to the 2021 Darkstuhl seminar on software engineering research methods training. So when I gave that seminar, uh, this talk last year, uh, I started by giving students an overview of the process of science. So in science, uh, you devise, you create an initial theory, for example, by interviewing experts, performing qualitative data analysis, and that leads you to your first uh, version of a theory. Then you may use that theory in action research or case study research to evaluate its usefulness, get feedback, and then turn what you learned into further elaboration or revision of the theory in underwork and thereby improve it. You're building out incrementally the theory you're working on. At the same point in time or at any point in time, your theory should be able to generate hypotheses, interesting predictions about um, about how to do certain things. So if I do this, uh, this other thing will follow. And such hypotheses can be tested. And if you perform that with your theory, you're testing those hypotheses and you're validating your theory. In general, you usually perform qualitative uh, research first to incrementally build out your theory using theory evaluation because um, the rigorous hypothesis testing can be quite expensive, so you only start with that usually when you have a good feeling that your hypotheses, that's what you hope for, of course, turn out to be true and thereby support your theory. Now, when I explained all of that uh, last year in person, um, I saw lots of question marks in the faces of our students. And the reason, as I quickly learned, was that it is not so common to be taught what this core central element of science that I just explained is. What is a theory? Is that crystal clear to everyone or not? So um, a theory is uh, the key output of your work, or more precisely, even though this is here, just a simple way of presenting it. A theory is that knowledge or model or framework, whatever that you generate, that can be used for correct prediction uh, of the future in one way or another. And um, to correctly predict or to create a reliable outcome so that uh, we learn, we better understand the world and how it functions. So it's scientific knowledge um, as we uh, become able to predict and uh, reliably generate. For example, if we have theories of engineering, then uh, for example, how, how, how electricity works, how liquids flow, then if we have good theories for that, we will be able to build a factory that doesn't explode. It's a prediction that it doesn't explode and we build it that way. So for that reason, this is predicting, that's the purpose of theory, uh, to be able to predict. And the science, our science then, is the process of building such theories and increasing the certainty of uh, our belief or the certainty in its truth over time. Our theories uh, are initially just proposed. We have no idea whether they are true. They are put to the test over time using hypothesis testing and Either they usually get replaced by something new or they kind of sink in as we find more and more corroborating evidence that they are true. So science is the process of building out those theories and theories are the key results of our work. Now theories may sometimes have a bad name in, oh, that's theoretical. But in science, that's not true. Theory, again, is the core uh, outcome of your work and whatever you do around it, you're programming some system that is all in support of building out those theories and validating them. 
Here is how physicists might present their theories to you. Engineers might present the theories to you. These are Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism and so forth. And as you can see, nice mathematics. Uh, they use the language of math to explain these equ equations. And then, of course, they also use prose to explain the symbols some more. When was the last time that you used differential equations to present a theory to readers in a journal in software engineering research? Probably been a while or more likely never. And the reason is, or well, the observation is that in software engineering research, we much more likely are to present our work using prose. The general preferred way of presenting work results, theories, uh, is prose. Lots of text. With all the challenges of it, uh, which are potential inconsistencies, uh, bugs, um, lack of clarity of communication if not written well, etc. So all kinds of challenges with that. Uh, for that reason, often we use, or for illustration purposes, we often use for diagrams. Here, for example, using one of my research papers as an example, we use cause and effect diagrams. So we have some cause and we have some effect and we annotated it, annotated with the empirical data that made us hypothesize that relationship and so forth. So we use interesting diagrams to more succinctly communicate our theories. Also, often, we pose interesting resulting hypotheses as the result of our theory work because uh, not so much because the hypothesis is the theory it's not it's an outgrowth of the theory but because it is a quality aspect or quality measure of a good theory that it can actually create interesting hypotheses if a theory cannot generate any hypotheses to test then it's not a scientific theory. It's a conspiracy theory, perhaps, but not a scientific theory. All good scientific theories let us make those predictions in the form of hypotheses that we can test. And then if their tests turn out to be true, we validate or contribute to the validation of the theory uh, or not. Here's a way of how information systems researchers uh, present theories in the form of research models or research frameworks. They define various constructs like personal innovativeness and then they relate constructs by hypothesized relationships. Uh, so, for example, the availability, the availability of a program uh, influences positively the adoption uh, of the underlying mechanism in a source in this example. And all of that may be moderated by, again, personal innovativeness or past experience in open source and what have you. So this is a diagrammatic depiction of hypotheses and the constructs. They relate to each other. And so there's complementing pros, of course. But this is something useful that you can then put to the test. Now, these are presentations of theory uh, as we describe the results of our work. And so they have a purpose, which is, for example, to serve in this cycle of science, of building out theories and validating them. So as illustrated here, theory presentation, like in the forms just given, theory presentation is a follows on to the initial theory creation and feeds into theory evaluation or validation. You need to present your theory, codify it, if you will, before you can evaluate it. And we do that in science so that uh, we can hold our own feet to the fire, but also so that others can see and understand what we are doing and others can replicate our work or continue our work. So it becomes intersubjectively shared and work can continue. So the presentation of the theory is key as it feeds into the follow-on steps. Follow-on steps, again, in theory evaluation could be action research, case study research, grounded theory, what have you. And in theory validation, it's controlled experiments, hypothesis testing service. All those nice 
research methods that you've been hearing, hearing about in the seminar. So um, here's an example, research design. Um, we would uh, create a theory, maybe using a qualitative survey. So here follows from the initial creation uh, a theory, and then we will evaluate it in multiple iterations of action research or case study research. There's implied here that the theory under development that is being built out initially moves fast and hence that action research is a better choice because in action research the researcher um, uh, is active and it's in the researcher's mind how the theory works while later on as the theory gets more stable you can share it with say practitioners who then carry out uh, who then use your theory in their practical work and you don't need to guide them. So um, this is how in science your theory would be used uh, for evaluation and validation purposes. Here again the four ways that we discussed of how to present theories. Now is there something missing? Does it make sense? I hope it makes sense, but this is all just for ourselves, it's from scientists for scientists. Isn't the purpose of performing science and scientific research in the first place to not only generate those theories so that we can publish papers, but actually to give practitioners good theories for them to better perform their own work. How is a practitioner going to take the research model or the cause and effect diagram to become a better software developer or to better manage a 100-person development shop? Probably no practitioner and only scientists will read these presentations of theory. So what's sorely missing from the way how we typically present our research results as theories and journals is a way of presenting our results in such a way that it actually serves its original purpose of making the world better because practitioners can use it because our theories are good and they are understandable by practitioners and they can be put to use by practitioners. So um, when this dawned on us a couple of years back, we set out to develop the handbook method, which at its heart codifies or presents theories in the form of pattern handbooks. We initially had a whole set of research designs around it, but ultimately you can use any research design as you want, as long as if you follow this method, you codify, you present your theory as these handbooks that I'm going to show you. And then, as we will see, it will be a primary quality of these handbooks that they can not only be used in the scientific process of further on evaluation and validation, but they can also be directly used by practitioners, fulfilling our original purpose of making the world a better place. So what are pattern handbooks? Well, handbooks in general are a handy reference work on a particular subject. And then uh, of patterns. Patterns are a particular format of presentation and usually or often what the pattern presents is called in industry terminology the best practice. Maybe it's more a current practice. Industry calls it best practice. What we currently believe is the best possible for solution for a given problem in a given context and so forth, tying in with the pattern community's understanding of what a pattern is. So a pattern handbook will be a collection of best practices of how to do things uh, are presented in a particular pattern format. Uh, we usually use the context problem solution format of presentation. Coming top down here, a pattern handbook has a structure, often introduction and roles if people are involved, follows an overview of the overall domain. And if it's large enough and there's not just one domain, a breakdown of that big domain into subdomains, where for each subdomain we will present 
the various patterns and how they interact and so forth. So here's an example. Uh, so for um, in managing open source software that you use in software products, uh, you need to make sure that you know exactly what's in your product because you have to comply with the licenses. So one subdomain of this is to make sure no supplier uh, or all suppliers who give you commercial libraries also tell you what's in their commercial libraries because there might also be open source software hiding in those commercial libraries that you use. So you need to manage your suppliers. If you're a software vendor, you need to manage your suppliers and make sure you know what's in this. So you break down how you deal with suppliers into its various aspects. It leads to various patterns. These patterns can be arranged, for example, in process templates or workflow templates because no pattern is an island. They all interact. If a pattern or some patterns are activities and activities feed into each other and so forth. Um, the details of how to structure this may depend on the domain. Here in supplier management for open source governance, uh, we just have these um, eight patterns and how they relate. Now the individual patterns still need to be described. We use the context problem solution triple in our example where there is an abstraction from the context and the forces in that context. Uh, the problem that is supposed to be addressed and how the solution in that context solves the problem by playing on the forces, relating them, having them uh, work out in your favor by aligning or by setting up a solution so that this alignment happens. Here's an example pattern description. We like to keep them short, but uh, people present patterns in very different ways and uh, all reasonable pattern formats are just fine. The good thing about this pattern format is it's not an invention by me, obviously. The patterns community uh, has been added for more than 25 years by now. Um, as they say, mining or discovering patterns, proposing them and uh, discussing them in writers' workshops and so forth. Sadly, the patterns community is somewhat um, disjoint in its terminology from the scientific community, even though in person there is a lot of overlap. Um, I myself helped create the patterns community 25 years ago, but it's not in the language. So if you, for the first time, join the patterns community to present, say, your research work and as proposed patterns, be aware of potential discrepancies in how we talk about things. So going back to the handbook method with the pattern handbook as the central artifact, where the pattern handbook represents a theory under development. Well, we have just our typical research design. Let me iterate that because we've done this a couple of times now. We often uh, start out with a qualitative survey, meaning expert interviews we perform qualitative data analysis to derive a first version of the theory. And then we evaluate the theory in steps. We usually start with action research because the early versions of the theory in pattern handbook form will uh, not be that mature, will need refinement. So it needs the researcher to be there and help interpret it properly. But as the, uh, so action research of course also feeds generates new empirical data, which feeds back into the development of the theory in pattern handbook form, which then as it matures is moved into case study research where the researcher is more hands off, hopes or expects that the pattern handbook speaks for itself and can be given to people uh, where the researcher does not have to intervene any longer so they become more passive and just observe. At some point of time, you can also use the patterns in the handbook as hypotheses, uh, proposed best practices as hypotheses and run controlled experiments or other hypotheses testing research methods to more validate the theory under development. As I also mentioned earlier, since experiments are comparatively expensive, uh, 
you typically wait until there's maturity or you ex think there's maturity in your uh, theory before you, you test it. And as might have been obvious in what I just described, there's a lot of interaction necessary with industry. But the good thing is the presentation of the theory as a pattern hands book, as practical, as I explained, its purpose is to be used by practitioners. So you can take it with you into action research. You can give it to practitioners for case study research. And this way, um, it will not only serve your purposes of theory evaluation, it will serve industry's purposes of performing their work because it's understandable and practical. It's not a set of hypotheses or cause and effect diagrams that are not actionable. If you're able to present your theory in this particular form, it will be immediately useful for industry. And so it is our experience that not only do they want to work with you, they're even willing to fund your research because now your output is not abstract theory in a way inaccessible to industry, but practical theory cast in a way that makes it comparatively easy by industry to use it. And hence, it is immediately valuable for them, which you can turn into research funding. And if you worry now about your publications or your career, uh, it is actually positive in that respect too. Um, because every single pattern is effectively a hypothesis about what experts tell you, but still needs to be validated, uh, how to do certain things, what current best practice is. And so you can take every single pattern, and usually you write a lot of patterns if you write a pattern handbook, and treat it as their own hypothesis, hypothesis to be tested. So in a resulting paper, you get one, uh, you get two, three, four here, where each pattern has a distinct derivation from qualitative research using qualitative survey and action research and case study research. You show how you came to that pattern, but then you can also validate it using, say, a controlled experiment. And that is a nicely publishable paper in my book because it goes full circle. It's a, quite a challenge in research to go full circle all the way from theory building, initial conception, all the way to a hard hypothesis testing validation. We describe our work in this technical report, soon to be a journal paper. And if you like it, uh, feel free to check it out and send us some feedback. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'm open for questions now.